welcome to Good News News. Like always, boy, do we have some news for you. Today's stories, Vax by Vaccines, this might be your views. Gangster goes under and gives God the glory. Zila Zimbabwean zeroes in on her school's desires. Here hopes huge hues. Okay, supposed to say news, but I couldn't think of a better word. Anyway, all this and more on GNN, but for now, how about some news? Now, in a story that not only proves that A is nothing but a number, but it also makes me question everything that I've been doing with my life. Maud Chifamba from Zimbabwe became the youngest university. Yes, you heard me right. No need to clean your ears. I said youngest university student in Africa. She was accepted into the accounting program of the University of Zimbabwe. And if that isn't enough, well, it seems like she's only getting started. More from our Zimbabwe correspondent, Unique Zimuto. Take it away, Unique. As of 2012, Maud Chifamba was the youngest university student in Africa. She was born in 1997 in Zimbabwe and was accepted to the University of Zimbabwe to study for an accounting degree at the age of 14. Yuzet's youngest ever student at 14 is now a chartered accountant. Her aim is to one day open the Maud Chifamba Foundation, which will be remodeling and upgrading local schools, making them fit for 21st century education. She's already started walking on that path. The process took its sweet time. She has started building school blocks at her former school, Huruza Primary School, which is located 18 kilometers outside Kwekwe. Unique Zimuto, GNN, Zimbabwe. Man, I really hope my mom isn't watching this because you know how African parents are. I'm watching, and you said she was only 14, and now she's a chartered yes. accountant, and she's building her yes. school yes. over again. Tapiwaka, and look at what you're doing now. I you need to be me all sitting in front of a green screen in a basement somewhere. It's because of your video games. Uh -huh. Video games. But at least it's something. Ow! Sorry about that. So at 24, Maud has already started building school blocks at her former school, while I, on the other hand, have reached level 24 on Roblox. So, you know, kind of doing the same thing, right, Mom? No? Well, anyways, this is such an inspiring story, not only for remembering where you came from, but Here's someone who, when she made it, she didn't turn her back on where she grew up, but rather wants to better it. Maud, from us here at GNN, we would like to say, you're making us look bad. And secondly, keep up the good work. Now, a question that has been on everyone's mind as of late has been to be or not to be vaccinated. Now, on one hand, you have people saying that the science backs it up and you should 100% get vaccinated. But on the other hand, you have people who are saying, let me wait this one out and see what happens in a couple of years time. And if something happens to you, well, <laughs> I told you so. Now, if you've been wondering what the church position is when it comes to COVID-19 vaccinations, church leaders are encouraging people to get vaccinated. The Southern Zambia Union Conference publicly aired a vaccination campaign on Hope Channel Zambia. For more, let's hear what Dr. Alex Laguna has to say. The General Conference actually had a statement on vaccination way back in 2014. And this vaccination statement still continues to be utilized. And it is more so important during this time of the pandemic. Okay. Now, the statement that the church is saying is that we are encouraging people. The church is not neutral. It does not say, well, it's up to you to decide whether you want to be vaccinated or not. But it is recommending and encouraging people to have a vaccination. One of the reasons, you see, the church is not just going to stand because it believes that this vaccine is very important. This vaccine can really save lives. Not only that, also to prevent infection to other people. 
You know, when we are going to have this COVID infection, it is not only us who are going to be involved. I know of families. First of all, the wife got it and then the husband got it. The husband even died. Not only that, but also to the grandparents. So it is really also a social responsibility. And as you know, with this Delta variant going on, and we have so many variants going on, Alpha, Beta here in South Africa, then Delta, Delta even plus, and then the Lambda, the more we wait for us to be vaccinated, the more these var variants are going to come up. And when they come up, they become more virulent, they become more vicious, and it is more difficult for us to treat. So it's very important that when we embark in vaccination, it helps to prevent these variants from coming up. But what does the vaccine do? Okay, first of all, you have to realize then when you get vaccinated, the body is prepared for a viral attack. You know, like for instance, if you know that somebody is going to come into your house uh, to be a thief or to steal, what you do is you prepare the house so that when the thief is going to come, then you are well prepared. And this is exactly what happens when we have this vaccination. It prepares the body for an assault of the virus so that when the virus comes, immediately, the soldier, the soldier cells of the body come into effect, the soldier cells which have been formed by the vaccine. Then they immediately attack. Whereas if you're going to say, well, anyway, I'm just going to wait for my natural immunity. So it is just like actually saying, okay, I'll just wait until the thief comes. And when the thief comes, that's the time that I'm going to be prepared. And by the time, it's going to be too late. So we are encouraging you so that when you get that vaccination and this virus is very rampant, it is all around these days, then your body is able immediately to mount a defense. Well, also one of the things that the rumors are going on there is that this vaccine is the mark of the beast. Now, I don't know what Bible you are referring to or whose authority you're getting it from, but according to the statement of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, you see that we actually understand that the mark of the beast is really whom you give your allegiance to, your loyalty. It is not a vaccine, my friends. And so, we encourage you because this is not really a matter of what we call the mark of the beast because I know many people equate the vaccine to the mark of the beast. Now, if you really look at the mark of the beast, it is really a sign that you are disloyal to God. In the final analysis, the mark of the beast is really disobedience to God. And this is it, my friends. If we want God to have to mark of the seal of God, then we should obey and follow the commandments what God has given us. Uh, it's going to be shown in the screen about the exact wordings of the church on this, what we call the mark of the beast. Some people say, okay, there are nanoparticles and when you are going to get injected, these nanoparticles are just like small chips and then they can actually identify you. They can track you anywhere. Well, I tell you, it is true that technology is present, but it is not present in the vaccine. In order for you to be able to be tracked with the chip, the smallest size is the size of a rice grain. And nothing of that sort can be found in the vaccine. And I tell you, if you are afraid of being tracked, then you might as well throw away your cell phone, throw away your smartwatches, throw away your laptops, because those are the things that are going to be able to track you down. And of course, lastly, the church is actually saying, you know, we are not the conscience. People can finally decide what they want to do. Because I know there are so many people out there who are really so scared and they are really sincere. And so we leave the decision to you, but we are not mandating as a church. We are encouraging because we love you. We want you to be spared from this virus so that you would be able to spread the gospel so that you are going to be healthy. And above all, let us treat each other with respect and love. If people don't want to be vaccinated, then I say, okay, it's up to you. But our responsibility is that let us show people the evidence. I 100% agree with Dr. Laguna.
And to be honest, I don't know if I really buy the whole God is there so I don't need a vaccine thing. Look, don't get me wrong, okay? Yes, God is there and yes, he does protect us. But just because he's there and he protects us, you don't see people running in front of a bus just to prove it, do you? In fact, it kind of reminds me of that time in the Bible when the devil is like, if you're the son of God, jump down and the angels will protect you. Yes, he could have jumped down and been protected by the angels. But what did Jesus do? He said, get thee behind me, Satan. So for those of you who attempted to use God's existence to live recklessly, tell the devil, get thee behind you. Okay, I get it. I get it. The whole mark of the beast thing, it is scary. And it's something that we should be very, very weary of. But like Dr. Laguna said, the mark of the beast, it's about the allegiance to God. So I don't know about you, but when my time comes to get that vaccine, well, I'm going to just go right ahead and get it. Now, speaking of Hope Channel, I come bringing good news from the Indian Ocean region. There's a new Hope Channel station. In addition to the Hope Channel family, if you will. A baby Hope Channel. Aww. Look at it. Kind of cute, don't you think? Who's the new channel? Yes, you are. Huh? It's kind of cute. The Hope Channel Ocean Indian was created to share the good news, especially because of this pandemic that is ravaging the world. We can no longer work as we used to. However, this site can be accessed any place where there is a connection. We started this site in June 2021. The languages of the program are French, Malakasi and Creole. But we also plan to put English language later. We hope that uh, this will help the audience to find Jesus first and also to live according to his will from her through the programs of education, health, family, and so on. Thanks, Pastor Rado and the team for your hard work. In a community that had been suffering for the past few years from gang violence, there is some good news. A gang leader's baptism in the Kahululu neighborhood has turned momentum in the right direction. This young man's baptism happened through, get this, the influence of one of his friends. Now, together with 31 other people, Joaquin Paulino was baptized. These baptisms? Well, they were conducted by Pastor Enrique Romeo Campagnala. With these baptisms, the district has now reached around 195 people this year alone. We praise God for these people and continue praying for the community as they reach out. Staying in Angola. Boy, do we have a treat for you. Because usually about this time, this is where I would introduce someone from the church that is doing some really amazing things. And, you know, I'll get all hype and I'll be like, give a warm round. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's amazing. It's all amazing. But this week, <laughs> I thought I'd do something a little different. Switch it up. Oh, yeah. Bongo Mission is the oldest mission hospital in Angola. And the journey to get to where they are now is amazing. And where are they now, you may ask? I'll tell you right after this. Shortly after Angola became independent from Portugal in 1975, civil war broke out. The war lasted for more than 25 years.
One of the fighting groups called UNITA had soldiers stationed to the south of Bongo Mission Hospital. A rival faction had soldiers to the north. Bongo Mission was caught in the middle. It sounded for the world that the mission had been completely destroyed by multiple groups of marauding troops. We did not believe that we would ever see Bongo rise again. Y entonces me acosté a dormir, de repente me desperté con tiroteos intenso, pa 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 pa, pa tiroteo intenso. Y de repente, pum, se me hizo claro en la mente, es la unita y vienen a buscarme. In the first half of the 20th century, 100 years ago, missionaries established 25 hospitals for the Adventist Church across Africa. Most of our 25 hospitals are bush hospitals, as we call them, end-of-the-road hospitals, hospitals that are, that are out in the villages. The church had decided to open the work in Angola, and they asked my grandfather, James, and grandmother, Annie Baker, if they would go to Angola and they accepted the call and traveled by ship from South Africa to Libido Bay. They got on the train looking for some property land where they could establish a mission. While on the train, a regional governor overheard the Bakers talking about their work. And he wanted to have the Adventist mission in his territory. So he says, why won't you just establish a mission in my area? And they said, well, we're not really looking in your area. We're looking a little further east. He said, well, if you change your mind, let me know. Not finding what they were looking for further east, the Bakers ended up going back to the regional governor. He showed them a property called Bongo. And they said, this looks really great. And so they traveled to Luanda and uh, met the governor general. The governor general agreed to give land to the Bakers. And in 1924, the first Seventh-day Adventist mission in Angola was established at Bongo. And so the first thing they did was start a treatment room, not actually a hospital to begin with, but a treatment room. And my grandmother, who was a registered nurse, ran the treatment room. And then they proceeded to build the church and build the school. And then along the way, they built quite a few different things so that the mission became self-sustaining and prospered. And this used to be a thriving hospital up until the mid-70s. This was one of the best hospitals in the country. Angola has a somewhat tragic history. It uh, started with the war for independence in Portugal in the mid-70s, uh, but then quickly morphed into a, a struggle of ideological control of the country that went into a civil war for 25 years, a bloody civil war that destroyed much of the country. Similar to what happened in other countries in Africa, certainly Rwanda during the genocide and Mozambique during their civil war, many of the professionals left Angola during the civil war. Es siempre desde que era pequeña quise ser una enfermera, misionera. Mi sueño era ir al Amazonas. Nunca pensé en venir a África. Antonita. Me encontré con una persona responsable de la división euroafricana y eh, hablé con él y le pregunté qué posibilidades había de ir al campo misionero. Tres días después, recibí una carta invitándome a venir a Angola. Yo acepté inmediatamente. Civil war was raging in Angola. Victoria was asked if she would go work at Bongo Mission Hospital. Que mi entusiasmo era tan grande que no me importó mucho que hubiera una guerra. Yo lo que quería era servir al Señor en el campo misionero, con guerra o sin guerra una revista donde se contaba toda la historia de la guerra civil de Angola. Y había un mapa de Angola con la línea divisoria entre los dos grupos eh, que combatían entre sí. Y mirando en detalles vi que la línea pasaba exactamente donde debería estar la misión. 
Y entonces me preocupé un poco. Efectivamente, cuando llegué aquí, eh, la línea divisoria entre los dos grupos pasaba exactamente aquí, en el bongo. Cuando llegué acá a la misión, lo primero que vi fue soldados por todas partes, con sus armas. Recibíamos pacientes eh, heridos por la guerra. During the night, soldiers would bury landmines along the road near Bongo. The next day, civilians would not know where those landmines were. Explotaba y volaban las piernas, eh, volaban los cuerpos. Y nos traían aquí a nosotros los heridos eh, con las piernas amputadas. Era muy intenso, eh, muy duro, muy duro. El comienzo fue muy difícil. Eh, adaptarse a todo eso, ver esos cuerpos despedazados, era cosa muy difícil de soportar. One of the groups fighting on the front lines at Bongo was called UNITA. In an attempt to weaken their enemies' ties with foreign governments, UNITA began kidnapping foreign nationals. Y sabíamos que la UNITA capturaba gente. Y yo tenía muchísimo miedo de que eso me sucediera alguna vez. Y entonces me acosté, dormí, de repente me desperté con tiroteos intenso, pa, 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 tiroteo intenso. Se abre que un grupo de soldados viene, golpean con fuerza, la puerta se abre y los soldados entran dentro del hospital. Yo pensé, son soldados que están trayendo algún herido. Después me di cuenta que la manera de actuar de esos soldados, la manera como se movían, las actitudes, la rapidez de los movimientos, no era igual que los soldados que teníamos la costumbre de ver. Y de repente, ¡pum!, se me hizo claro en la mente, es la UNITA, y vienen a buscarme. Nunca me pasó por la cabeza la idea de huir. Solo lloraba, señor, por favor, ayúdame a saber lo que tengo que hacer y cómo tengo que decir cuando vengan. Y de repente escucho golpear a mi ventana. Cuando miro, había 30, 40 soldados allí, todos alrededor de la ventana, y empezaron a llamar, enfermera, enfermera, abra la puerta. Enfermera, enfermera, abra la puerta. Victoria did not open her door to the soldiers. She told them she had to stay and take care of the mission. She was trying to stall them, trying to think of a way out of the situation. Then the soldiers told her that they had already kidnapped the mission's doctor and his family, as well as a Brazilian family working at the mission. Both families had young babies. Dos familias con bebés pequeños en las manos de la UNITA. Entonces yo dije, tengo que ir, tengo que ir, ellos me necesitan. Entonces yo fui, abrí la puerta, le dije, aquí estoy, estoy pronta para ir. Y entonces ellos miraron que yo tenía sandalias en los pies y dice enfermera tiene que ponerse buenos zapatos porque vamos a caminar cuando pasamos por el hospital estaban las puertas abiertas pasamos por la farmacia estaban las ventanas rotas Todo el trabajo que hicimos se terminó. Luego empezamos, dimos la vuelta, empezamos a subir la montaña, esas montañas. Empezamos a subir la montaña y de pronto yo me vuelvo y veo fuego que sube de aquí, de la misión. Y bueno, ahí fue el momento en que yo dije, todo está perdido. Y ahí comenzó la jornada, una jornada que duró 35 días a pie, caminando, 5 días en camión militar y 3 meses con ellos en cautividad. Creo que yo siempre pensé que íbamos a sobrevivir, nunca tuve miedo de morir. After three months of captivity, Victoria and the two other families regained their freedom by crossing the southern border and going into Namibia. 
For their own safety, they did not return to Angola, and they did not know if Bongo Mission was destroyed. It sounded for the world that the mission had been completely destroyed. The rebels came in here and, and basically everybody had to leave. Some of the national nurses tried to keep the hospital going for some years, but even they finally had to, to leave. Uh, and when you have an abandoned facility, then it gets vandalized and things happen. We did not believe that we would ever see Bongo rise again. After escaping captivity, Victoria's life continued. She married and had children. But Bongo Mission and the people of Angola never left her thoughts. Eh, los angolanos son personas muy queridas, muy amorosas. Y toda mi vida pensé en Bongo y en volver algún día. Y bueno, cuando mis hijos quedaron, fueron grandes, que ya no necesitaban más de nosotros, con mi esposo decidimos eh, hacer la aventura de volver. Victoria and her husband Juan returned to Bongo. She is now chief nurse and administrator of the hospital. Volver a este lugar después de la guerra, encontrarme con los sobrevivientes, fue mucha emoción y mucha alegría y una, una gran experiencia en mi vida. Y Bongo está aquí. Entonces aquí la línea marcaba de este lado dominio del gobierno eh, del de Luanda y de aquí para abajo controlado por la UNITA. Esta es la bandera de Portugal, de mi país, donde yo nací. Bandera de Argentina. Bandera, bandera de, de Portugal. Portugal. Aquí tenemos una foto más actualizada de la familia. Eh, Joel, Gabriel, Jessica, su esposo y la bebé Mía. Que ahora ya es más grande, tiene dos años. In the summer of 2018, Loma Linda University sponsored a trip to Bongo Mission. It's always been my dream to see the mission that my grandfather and grandmother started. Then I got the invitation to come and I jumped at the chance. As we drove up to Bongo Mission, on both sides of the truck were women of the villages who were singing songs of greeting. And then we met Victoria, and she was the one who led the greeting and put together this reception. And we knew that she was the one who had been here, who had endured through this time. And here she was greeting us and welcoming us back. Overwhelmed. Victoria and Juan, they bring a passion that is absolutely essential in a place like this. It's not just a, Victoria's own story of being kidnapped and, and, and being freed again. It's a story of this place can succeed. Uh, she doesn't know the word impossible. She looks at everything and says, man, we can make this happen. The hospital in the area rural is important para dar apoyo a las comunidades rurales que no tienen otro, me, otro lugar donde tratarse. She's bringing things back. Uh, volunteers have come, many volunteers from Europe, from the U.S., from South America. Volunteers have donated money. So one by one, they've been rehabilitating the buildings. As I walk through much of this now, there's new tile on the floor, there's new paint on the walls. The clinical lab is working. They've got a successful laboratory here now. They've got a portable x-ray. They've got basic equipment. So the clinical facilities are starting to come back. And that's largely because of Victoria's faith and commitment. It will need a lot of money to rehabilitate the buildings. The capital expenses need to be brought in from the outside. But we want to keep it sustainable because despite the fact that we were in villages, these people have enough means, they value the reputation of this hospital, so they come here and are willing to pay to be seen. El futuro del bongo es una gran pregunta. Ponemos, si estudiamos la realidad de Angola y hacemos aquí aquello que nadie hace a bajo costo, 
el hospital podría ser una luz y un testimonio en este país, como fue en el pasado. Now, after all of this, okay, after all that Vongo went through, it's being rebuilt. And not only that, okay, plans are underway to build a state-of-the-art polytechnic institution. They're receiving support for their medical facility from none other than our very own Loma Linda University. I mean, these guys are doing so many things. If I was to go on and on and on and on, we would need a 24-hour GNN special. And believe me, after about 20 minutes of hearing my voice, you will have some regrets. So, to save yourself some trouble, I would encourage you to go check out their Facebook page. You'll see all that they're doing. I promise you, you will not be disappointed. And there you have it, folks, another installment of GNN. Now, good news, everyone. You can now follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Oh, yeah. We have social media. And to reach us there, all you got to do is go to those platforms and type at GNN Echo, and boom, you got us. Now, be sure to check us out. But until next time, did you even come up with something? No. Uh -huh, I knew it. You see, you still can't even think of anything Sorry. to say. I bet Mark would have thought of something to say. It's those videos. Did you just switch out the music to drown my voice? No. Nowhere. You switched off my... Yeah, and you're walking away. There's a fever after the show. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna 